I'm, I'm on my treatment plan, I'm getting fixed. Uh, when I got to the unit, four guards showed up and asked me to go with them. And I didn't, didn't, didn't think much about it, you know, just, I just followed them. And then the next thing I saw segregation on this, on the steel door and they opened it. And I went and then I thought, this ain't good. And then I says, look, I was honest, I'm trying to get help. And at this point, the guards didn't care. In the cell, I went. Uh, I was very angry, so I cut myself and wrote the words hate in my blood on the glass window. And then this guard walked by and looked at and says, Mr. Wakai, if you want to F around, we can deal with you even, even more than we are now. And at that point, I kind of knew I was out of the institution. Uh, a prison ban came. It was my 20th birthday and they took me to Millbrook uh, Maximum Security Prison. And for a 20 year old, that's a, that's a scary thought. And then I learned that a psychiatrist really can't fix you. That a psychologist really can't fix you and a social worker really can't fix you. I didn't really know yet how it's gonna be fixed. I did keep looking at God. Uh, but I sat in that van and I remember as we went to the different institutions to pick up inmates who were reclassified as maximum security, I just remember thinking, I wish, I wish this band would never get there. I just wanted to sit on the band. I didn't want to go into the prison. And uh, you know, usually for provincial inmates, they don't have guards with firearms. This band, they had a guard in the back with firearms. Uh, the band was all uh, barred up windows. And at the age of 20, I was probably one of the smallest and wimpiest guys there. Like I did violent things, but I wasn't tough. There was way tougher inmates than me. There was, there was bikers that were on this bus. There was guys from federal maximum security prisons that got off their parole and maybe did something fairly minor, but you know, they were maximum security inmates. They're classified that way and they were going and they were violent guys. There was a couple murderers on that band that, you know, maybe had manslaughter and uh, they were off their parole and they were, they were going to this prison maybe for two years for something, something else. So I was absolutely terrified. And I remember we got through those doors. I remember the doors closed with a 30 foot, uh, 30 foot brick wall, guard towers. Um, I think I had to go through about four locked doors to even get to the reception unit. And I was just scared. And uh, you know, inmates know when you're scared and they're not the most compassionate, uh, you know, you know uh, kind individuals. Uh, a couple inmates were calling me names, uh, bullying me a little bit. Uh, so I thought, you know, I, I gotta survive. I saw, I saw one inmate actually get stabbed. This, this, this jail, it's not open anymore, uh, but it, it made 50% of, uh, of Ontario's license plates. So it isn't a myth. Uh, prisons did make license plates, which was the one useful thing it did actually. Uh, it was about six hours of work and the rest of the time we'd be locked up in our cells because it was max. Um, so we were making license plates and this one inmate made a knife out of his license plate. I guess the guards weren't watching him. And he went and stabbed a guy and, when I saw that, I just said, you know, I'm doing whatever I have to do to, to get out of this because I, I had no reputation. So, you know, I knew that I could very well be the next guy. So I got a whole bunch of uh, paper the following day and put it on my license plate press and set it on fire. And, uh, you know, guards looked at that and said, why you did that? And I said, no, no good reason. It's just what I want to do. Well, so I got an arson. Um, then when I was in my cell waiting for my hearing for that, I had a fairly long toothbrush, I sharpened that up to a knife, and then I also got a razor blade, and uh, then I made a death threat. I cut my finger and wrote it, and gave a death threat to the guard as he came to my cell. He didn't say nothing, but he read it and walked away. Uh, basically, the response that I wanted, 10 guards came to my door, and then I pulled my knife on him, and uh, I'll tell you, a 20 year old kid with a sharpened toothbrush could be a little bit dangerous, but they're not much of a, not much of a match for, for 10 guards, they just, uh, they just basically uh, had a blanket over my head and all of them were on top of me and I stabbed through the blanket and then he broke my, my toothbrush and then that was the end of it. I was uh, put in the handcuffs and dragged to the hole. Well, by then I did enough that, that I, was, I was considered, even though I wasn't, I was considered, maybe I was because of desperation, but like I said, you got bikers, you got guys that are twice my size. They decided I was one of the most dangerous inmates in their institution. That's what one guard said. And with that, I got six months in the hole, which was right up to the end of my 15 months. I actually did 13 and a half months out of 15. I lost a hell of a lot of good time and I sure wasn't getting parole. But I sat in segregation for six months solid. And uh, that's where I saw that what it could do to you psychologically, because you're just in this cell all the time. Um, you don't have human contact. So I remember one time they let me out to cut my hair because it was getting really long. And I remember thinking, my goodness, I, I feel a human when the barber 
touch my shoulder and then cut my hair. You know, it was, that's all the touch it was, just nothing really. But for me, it was incredibly significant. 